everyone, Bethany Wilson here from RBR, and this is my assistant, Chris Davison. Where have you been? I have been busy. <laughs> <laughs> we and, have uh, been busy. And we've been getting a lot of questions that we haven't been able to get to. So we've been busy, which is a good thing, but a bad thing yeah, also. It is a good time. thing. We've, we've got neighbor dogs. Uh, we've got some really great Neighbor news. Dogs, not, our dogs. not our dogs. Our dogs are behaving for now. Um, but yeah, we've got some really great news. Uh, you know, we've been doing some updates on the house. Now, if you're a client, when you come in, it officially looks nice. <laughs> and mm. and um, and then we have a new uh, employee. For those of you who have known me for a really long time, you guys know Maxine. Uh, she worked with me for a long time, and then she left me for a little while, and now she's back. <laughs> so now we have someone else helping us out, which is really awesome. All right, so this is number... 29. 29. We're getting there. We're getting, we're getting there. there. All right, guys, so we're going to dive right into question number... One. Just first names. Uh, question number one is from Tiffany. Tiffany writes, Hi Bethany, I've been working on reactivity issues with my six month old poodle mix pup outside with food. He does stop once I tell him to leave it and walk the other directions, but once he receives the food, he sometimes starts barking again. How would you go about this? He also seems to be jumping up a lot on things and on people and the rule of thumb is to ignore and look away, but it hasn't been working very well. It is also still nippy. Uh, not painfully or hard, uh, mostly the act of opening the mouth, and I have been showing a less affection, but he seems to think with hands on, with with when hands are going in towards him, they are toys. Thank you. That's pretty common. That's pretty common, Tiffany. Um, six months, it should definitely start to be weighing down, like going down, and I think I can tell why it hasn't yet, um, because reactivity issues. So... All right, once he receives food, starts barking again. Okay, so here's, this is a preference. Whether you say leave it or no, um, don't use leave it with food. So, so you probably taught leave it with food, but think about it this way. You have a piece of food in front of your dog and they don't go towards it, right? You say leave it and they stare, but they're still staring at the food. This is sometimes a big problem when teaching leave it, um, especially when you try to use it in a circumstance where you just mean no, don't bark at the dog, no. <laughs> because you really wanna teach leave it as back off and look away and then you get food. And sometimes there's just a real weird middle ground when you initially teach that with food, but then you're using the food as a redirect. It's It just, it gets, hectic, right? I would prefer you just use a no. Just correct the dog, pop correction, no. Then say your dog's name, which she doesn't mention, so my dog's name is Happy. So it would be like, and how old? Six months old. So I would still, yeah, six months old, that's a good age to be able to be like, no, pop, happy, come, and then use food. Good, and then give food. So the problem is, your dog is ready to go. I mean, ready to go, bark, might not be aggression, could just be excitement, but he's ready to go after something. So all you're doing, when you associate leave it, all you're, and then you reward for leave it, all you're doing is redirecting that barking energy, right? It's kind of like if I'm, if I'm like yelling at Chris, I would never do that. All the time. It is not all the time. Most and if it was, you would deserve it. So if I'm yelling at Chris, and I'm in the middle of yelling at Chris, and like someone, a friend of mine or something, gets my attention, I might be like, what? <laughs> because I'm transferring that energy, and then you're giving me a piece of food. You're like, good job, Bethany. <laughs> so, so I need you to snap your dog out of it. Just no. And then, pop correction, whatever, and then you get that moment of pause, then you give your dog a command. Dog sit dog come take a couple steps backwards sit then give food all right so you need that separation because all he's doing is transferring that energy with the barking then he gets food then he barks again you're you're not 
you're breaking the pattern a tiny bit, but not near enough to actually make a significant difference. So you need to change up your game. And you know, I'm like, I don't even mind if you use leave it, but it needs to be like a no. So you don't actually reward for leave it because he's still jazzed up, right? And you don't want to get food for that because then you're going to get him more excited and he just goes up, up, up. So it's literally like leave it, pop, and then dog's name come or, or you know, watch me. I mean, whatever it is you want to do, you've got to give a command. So you reward the command. Really jazzed up dogs, like, like our little dog Happy, for instance, when we used to do this kind of stuff with her, she was so, um, hey, settle down, hey. Lay down. Um, she would get so jazzed up that she would do the same thing if you gave her two commands. She needed several commands to like calm her down because she was so food motivated. She'd be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And with a puppy, I imagine you're dealing with something similar. So anyway, there's that. Um, jumping up on a lot of things on people, we correct for bad behavior. If a dog jumps up, I grab a leash and I pop down towards the ground. So the dog goes up and is popped down correction down towards the ground um, with the nippiness you know again you know I would just judge you know as long as you're not playing with the dog like if he if you go into like leash him up and he's like pop no <laughs> you know it's just it's just you need it just sounds like you need corrections at six months old we start to really introduce corrections pop corrections whatever the case may be so it sounds like that's what you need it really sounds like that's the main thing that you need all right hopefully that helps Tiffany all right. All right, question number two is from Grace. Grace writes, how to get your pup to understand a sit or down is also stay when they've learned the command from someone else. His false mom obviously didn't make that, a point, that point clear when training our adopted uh, just a month ago one-year-old. One-year-old Papillon. Papillon. Uh, spitz pup. Uh, it's been frustrating in the sense that he clearly knows the action of what I'm asking, but gets frustrated quickly and readjusts attention or gets distracted because he hasn't received this re his reward yet. I've only recently see adopted see adopted a dog a month ago. Uh, started following your page, but I've been loving all your info and techniques. Thank you so much for sharing them with us. All right, Grace. Well, what you need to do is go on uh, my YouTube channel. And did she say how old this dog was? She did. Oh, oh uh, one, one year, year old. old. Okay, so still kind of in like adolescent range. So you're having an impulse control pop problem, so you need to start to introduce corrections. Like, just not even like, oh my god, bad dog, pop, that's not what I mean. I mean just like cues, like, like, like just like, like, hey, you know, <laughs> pay attention. So if you ask your dog to sit and you're like, stay, and they're getting really antsy or whatever, you can just give them a little pop, hey, to refocus them. I know I'm not talking about like some big correction because he's behaving badly. Just information to try to get him to settle. There's that aspect of it. Go on my YouTube page and look at some of my videos. Um, the puppy videos would probably might be useful to you um, just to help a dog learn to calm down. Uh, the way that we teach stay is we teach place first with puppies and adult dogs alike. It's the easiest way because they have this like boundary and it helps them understand so much better that when I'm in this boundary and I stay, I get rewarded. And then you, what you do is you gradually make those rewards further and further apart. So, you know, I don't know the t kind of attention span that you're dealing with, but let's say that it's a really, like a younger puppy, how we would start is, um, you know, place and we lead them over to the mat. And again, I've got videos on this. You, you go to playlist on my YouTube channel, playlist and then puppy videos and pff, there's a ton. So that's where I would go to kind of understand a little bit better what I'm gonna quickly describe. So we would lead them onto place, have them sit or have them down. And then um, I would have food, I would have a food pouch for quick access. And then I would say good right away, good treat. Good treat. Good treat. Good treat treat. Good treat. You know what I mean? And then when the dog was getting real antsy, roll board, break, place, down. And then we do it all over again. Um, and then another thing, so that's one aspect of it. And then another big thing that is, uh, it's a, 
it's a technique, and I, and I don't want to make it sound like, oh, you have to do this correctly, but you kind of do. And, and that is, you say, there's a reason we have marker words. There's marker words and clicker training, is it helps you filter out the food. So what I mean by that is, you say, good treat, good treat, good treat to a really young dog, to or yes, or clicker, click, treat, to mark the good behavior, um, and then reward them right away. And then you create space because they already have this idea in their head of you know good yes click means I get food focus on mom I get food no hush whiny dog um, so then what you want to do is start to say place down good then give the treat stand you know good like even if you're still luring which you shouldn't be but let's say you're you're um, you you have to so you lure down with food good stand back up with the food then give the treat so you start to create space so I can do and then what what eventually happens is I can do place down good break place down good break place down good break good then give food well I did that wrong I meant to say another place down good wait 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 then give food so then you can start to make them do ten things you still mark all the good behaviors, then you finally give a piece of food. I hope that makes sense. If not, let me know. Did that make sense to you? Yes. <laughs> I, just, I was just thinking, where's my treat? Uh-huh, yeah. So, so you know, you, you put space between the verbal marker and when the dog gets the food, right? And, and what that means is, um, in its most simplest form, is just sit good. I have food, or I have food behind my back in a pouch. We put pouches, excuse me, pouches behind us so they don't get too food focused sometimes. I've said good, dog is waiting, then I give the food. So we create space so it makes it easier to filter out the food and you still always use your marker words or your marker clicker. All right, next. Cool. All right, question number three is from Amy. Amy writes, we have a four month old Schnauzer Terrier pup named Bruce. Uh, he pulls in every direction when leash walking. He's getting a little better when on the leash for potty time, but going for walks is still difficult. Uh, we're trying to keep him focused and use different smelly treats. Any other suggestions on how to control his impulse to run in every direction and make walks more enjoyable? Thanks for all your videos. Um, and, yeah, I help, uh, you know, uh, someone had mentioned that you can use food to get him to focus, and yes, you can. Um, you should be using lots of food like with a four-month-old puppy everything should be food oriented um, We introduce uh, Really significant correct. I don't want to be like we, we really correct the dogs at six five six months But we do start to introduce firmer corrections at five six months But there's always exceptions to that and we teach puppies how to walk on prong um, as early as 12 weeks old the really really bratty ones 10 weeks so what I would do if you're new to training is go on Amazon and look up star mark so s t a r m a r k training collar it is a mild mild prong collar and um and i and now if you're seasoned like of course if you're seasoned you probably wouldn't be asking me this for pulling but if you if you if you've walked a lot of dogs but you're just not used to puppies and and you have good leash skills you can go ahead and go for a prong collar but you do you do have to, you know, really know what you're doing with pressure and when to give in and blah, blah, blah. With a plastic training collar, not so much. Basically what happens is you need to do probably more food work. Um, I'm sure that woman is, is right. You do need to have better focus outside. Um, maybe have them a little hungry even. Um, and I don't, I don't want dogs to sit and stare at me when I'm walking. Um, like if they see a dog, I don't really want them to stop and look at me, but a lot of people train that way and they're very, very successful. Um, and that's perfectly fine. And, but here's the thing, I don't want adult dogs to do that. When you're dealing with puppies, it is a little different. You do want to get their focus. Even if I have to put food right in front of their nose and lift it up to my face, good as a child is running by you know screaming and carrying on and they want to chase them something like that however at the end of the day 
something, e even with all the work you do, even if you're super diligent inside, even if you have a really hungry dog, even if you pattern, you know, sit and hold food up, because a lot of times when you feed puppies food, a lot of times we go down to their level. So they never look up at us because they, because they sit and lay down and the food comes to them. So it is a good idea to make sure that when you start doing place down, you stand back up and even put the food up to your face so they'll look up at you. It's just habit. It's not even necessarily about teaching a watch me command. It's just about habit of getting them to look up. But anyway, make sure you're doing that inside. Make sure you're creating that pattern of behavior and practicing it 20 times. Place down, good treat break. I mean, over and over and over again, 20 times in 10 minutes, a couple times a day. That'll really help one aspect of it. But like I said before, at the end of the day, something's gonna cause them to run. And at four months old, there's no reason that you can't make it, that you uh, uh, can't make it uncomfortable for him to just dart because it should be uncomfortable for him because that's a really dangerous habit for him to get into. Now, if he was a Maltese, I would say no. A uh, little, little tiny Maltese, too young. Just, he's just gonna have to pull for a few more months, but Schnauzer Terrier pup? Yeah, should have no problem putting one of those training collars on, and it's uncomfortable for them. So what happens is they're less likely, they're gonna, they're gonna correct themselves a few times when they dart towards stuff, which you wanna prevent from happening as much as possible. But then what's gonna happen is, it's, if he even does pull, it's gonna be much less crazy <laughs> because he's gonna remember that it's really uncomfortable to dart to the end of the leash. Whereas now it's probably just flat pressure or harness pressure and he could care less about it. So that's that one part of it. There's an, one more aspect of this and then I'm gonna let you go, which is if you have like people in the neighborhood who he knows and he's like, oh my God, hi, and then they wanna pet the dog, it's you don't want him to pull, right? So you're working against the training if you let him pull you on a training collar or on anything, but especially if you're trying to train him so you put a training collar on him and he's pulling and you let him and he'll pull on it. It's, it doesn't, doesn't kill them. They'll pull on it. It's just if he runs to the end of the collar and hits it unexpectedly, that'll create more of an inhibition. But if you let him just pull to your neighbor, um, you're completely going against the draining. So uh, you kind of have to choose choose your battles. So, so something like that, if I wanted to let my neighbor say hi and I don't want my dog to pull on a training collar like that, I would probably like jog with my dog over to my neighbor to let him say hi just so he doesn't have a tight leash. Because it's all about teaching leash pressure. Um, what have you got? What have you got? Say it's all about leash pressure, happy dog. Um, and then if I was like, sorry, I'm training, I would let him hit the end of the leash and then be like, okay, let's go. And then I would turn around and excitedly, let's go, go the other way. Come on, let's go. Good job. Let's go. And I would go the other way and, and use food and get his attention and be like, sorry, we're training, you know, and go the opposite way. So you have to make those decisions when you start, when then your dogs start to hit the sage and, and you have to do that. So, yep. Hope that helps. She just have so much information for every single person. So? That's fine. Long questions. That was only Long six. That was mean. only six minutes. Mm -hmm. How much was one before? Five. Mm -hmm. The one before that was five. All right. Question number four is from Lene, maybe. Lean? lean? No, it's not lean. That's not lean. Lene, I think, is the right one. It could be lean. There's nothing wrong with lean. Okay. Um, Lene writes, uh, "How to teach a big puppy not to steal things from the counter when you are not in the room? My Samoyed stole and swallowed a whole kitchen sponge in one minute." that I left the room. Luckily, when we made her throw up the sponge, when we made her throw up the sponge, came out again in an entire one piece. This is this can be really life-threatening. Yes, it can. Uh, I always check, nothing is within reach, but that one time she took the chance. She surfs the moment she knows I can't see her. Someone else has mentioned, with even a younger puppy, the same. Yeah. Okay, you guys aren't gonna like my answer. I have nothing valuable. You don't leave the dog alone. It's a puppy. Yeah. You can't. And and I you know. Leave the room, you take the puppy with you. Yeah, and I think the Samoyed um, is older, like five months old or something. So she's about to reach the point where she can absolutely be corrected. So we really start correcting puppies significantly for things like this around the six-month-old mark, and then depending on the mindset of the dog, sometimes younger. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah. So there are if you like go online. 
And there, I've, I've had trainer friends of mine do this, and they've been successful at it. I haven't personally done it because we do remote caller training, so I don't have to. But I've literally had people's um, trainers have their clients, and it's worked, set up their dogs. Like they'll get a bunch of tin cans and put in a bowl and then attach a piece of chicken to a piece of string on the bowl. The dog grabs the chicken off the counter. You, you like watch him around the corner, grabs the chicken off the counter, scares the living crap out of the dog. You create an inhibition. You probably have to do that a few times. Like maybe if it's a puppy. Why is it scare the dog? Because it pulls the cans. Cans, the, yeah. The cans pulls off, the cans down, like scares the crap out of the dog, makes lots of noise. Um, personally, this is not my preference, but you know, I'm all about options. But I have had people use that and well two that I can think of that were like yeah that worked fine we did it a couple of times over the course of a month never had to do it again that's not my preference um, I just correct the dogs uh, we do remote collar training um, and then until the dogs are old enough to do remote collar training we don't leave them alone <laughs> I know that's so hard especially when the dog reaches that five six seven eight month old mark because it's just they're starting to be able to be more independent and you can leave the room and use the bathroom for five seconds but mm, maybe you can't because I mean we just had a golden retriever sweetest golden retriever ever if you leave like really just well behaved just normal puppy stuff that's what she was here for and if you left the room to use the bathroom to pee for 30 seconds you would come back and she'd be chewing on the edge of the rug but she'd never do that if you were in the room it's just puppy stuff it's normal you she can't was... <gasps> that's why Dusty's whining why the cat is on the pergola where? Look! That's why he's carrying on. Oh my gosh. And he's looking at- Oh, he just took off. No. Nope. There it is. Hi, kitty. We're you trying to figure out how to get cats off our roof. They fight on our roof. All kinds of crazy stuff. Okay, okay. anyway. Keep going. Sorry. <laughs> um, this is new. This is a new place for us. We've only been here a few months. We're figuring things out. Anyway, uh, when it comes to you know, the stuff like food on the table and things like that. You teach place, you uh, make it off limits, <laughs> totally off limits. Of course, you would never feed your dog from the table, things like that. But but even with my dogs, my dogs are older and I would, I mean, if I leave something, she would never, she would never do this. But if I would leave something on the counter and then go use the bathroom and come back, it's possible she might be up there eating food. I mean, it's, it's possible. She's very distracted, like especially with food. Yes, she's very distracted with food. We made sure we brought them out with us because I just put some big steaks <laughs> out on the counter so they get become room they temperature. Can rest or whatever. I bring them out here to grill and to like. There's no way we'd leave them alone oh, in there. No, they'd, be they'd be tethered if they were in there, and even then, I'd probably want to peek at them. It'd probably be the only time in their lives they ever chewed through a leash to try to get at something. So my point is just that stuff happens. And when it comes to the sponge thing, that definitely worries me um, because the, the sponge isn't food oriented, but you, you have to make sure that when something does happen, you don't get too excited about it. You don't get too mad. You don't get too emotional about it because dogs love to find ways to get their humans emotional, like grabbing a sock and running, things like that. And then the human, oh no, chases the dog, gets it out of their mouth and it's this big spectacle. And the dog's like, hey, I can control the human this way. Even if you're angry, they don't care. They just get a rise out of you. So it's when, a sign of love when they grab your socks, right? It's a sign of love. Oh yeah. It's like mine, love. my dogs love. Socks. It's just a sign of love. A sign of love. I like the roll in them and everything. It's. Uh... I don't think that's a sign of love. I think that's a sign of it needs to be washed. You don't. You know nothing. Oh my gosh. All right. So moving on. Question number five is from Tara. Tara writes, "How do you teach a 14-week-old puppy to take treats nicely? I'm afraid I'm going to confuse her by saying no when I said when I just said good for obeying a command. Good. <laughs> you, you could. Yeah. You like that." Uh, is there a technique to use separately to teach taking treats nicely? And then how do you apply and reinforce that when training other things? Thank you for your videos. Your techniques really work. I have a calm, well-behaved puppy because of you. I am amazed by all the things she has learned. We just started walking on a leash outside. A woman was running by and commented, what a well-behaved puppy. <laughs> uh, I get that comment about her a lot. It's, a, it's all in the training. Thank you. That's awesome, Tara. Tara, um, I'm 
got one of the dogs from German Shepherd Rescue. The little puppies oh, we had here. Oh, awesome. She got oh, a di- cool. she got a different one. It wasn't one of the ones we had, but she got a different oh, one. Good. Yeah. Um, okay. I that better be the right person. If not, ignore me. All right. So. They're coming for you. They're coming for me. Yeah. The chopper. The choppers. Get to the chopper. Sorry. Anyway, <laughs> you dated yourself. Um, I'm a cop, you idiot! <laughs> okay, okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, yes, you could confuse her if you like, sit good! No! <laughs> so, so what we do is, is nothing amazing, to be honest. Um, what we do is, uh, well, first of all, you could do flat hand. So she just gets in the habit of doing it that way. But when you're like this and you have food, what we do is we just hold it up to their, their mouth with the food in, inside, like covered up where they can't see it or get to it. And um, if they bite, if they're like, we have this, and if they're like, ah, we say, we do say no for that because that is a very, because it's not like they're reaching for a treat because we're not holding the treat out. The treat is in our hand. They can't see it. They're actually biting our skin. We can say no for that. And I'll even give them a little bop on the nose. So if I'm like that and they bite, I'll say no and give them a little boop. That's a personal thing. Boop, boop. <laughs> and she always makes that noise too. It's hilarious. Wait, when do I bop dog? We, har- we hardly ever have a, that issue with dogs. That's when have true. you seen me do that? She does it to me. Anyway, anyway, we did do that with Zoe, the little bull terrier we had when we would do crittering and she wanted to eat a squirrel. Crittering. And we would like say come and I'd run backwards and I would have food um, and I would have her sit. She'd reach up and take my, I would go, no. Is that a professional term? Bop her crittering? right on the nose. Yes, it is a professional term. Okay. I didn't make it up. I'm just asking. It's an actual technique. Someone else made it up. It's very smart. Anyway, um, so there's that. Um, and then what? And then what you do is you hold it in front of their their nose, and then when they lick it, when they lick your hand or nudge your hand, then you open up and or just work the treat to the front of your fingers and give them the treat. So you basically teach them to use their tongue and lick or just their nose and nudge without an open mouth. So you literally, you say sit, good, it's in, it's between your finger, but um, you know, you put it down in front of him, he uses his teeth, no, either do the little boop, um, <laughs> or just pull your arm away and, and wait a second, offer it again. Uh, no, pull away, nah. pull away, <laughs> offer it again, wait till you get that lick or that nudge, or the dog doesn't really even care, moves his head away, she's like, well fine, I don't get this, she'll get it eventually. It doesn't magically make her perfect, but um, but it'll help, and then we can kind of see how she develops long term. So. Cool. Alright, moving on, number six. Number six is from Sarah. Sarah writes, my 12-week-old puppy has been peeing in my basement. He doesn't go anywhere else in the house. I try to keep him at the gate and he sneaks down there every once in a while. How can I get him to stop doing this? We bring him out very often. Any tips or tricks would be helpful, thanks. He's 12 weeks old. Of course he does. You need a crate um, or put him in an exercise pin, line it with puppy pads. He's too young. Yeah, he's too, yeah, he's too young. No. Yeah. He's too young. Um, and it's, any, any puppy that has like space to move around, if it's had any water, every 30 minutes it'll it'll pee sometimes. Because you're not keeping him in a space where he's learning to hold his pee. It's not about the fact that you're taking him out constantly. Um, so now it's a habit. So he's like, okay, I can potty outside or I can potty downstairs. So he'll go downstairs to potty. And he probably, it probably feels like he sneaks because people, when they see their dog's potty, most people know not to shove their nose in it and make a big deal about it anymore, which is so old school. And there's nothing wrong with old school. There's lots of good old school stuff. That's not one of them. Um, people learn not to do that, but they're still like, no, and they might do an interrupter. I, you know, I tell people to clap. No, do an interrupter, take the dog outside, but don't get upset, don't get emotional about it. But even that, even, even without that, they'll be like, okay, well, I can't pee here, so I'll sneak under the couch. Or in your case, I'll go downstairs where I've peed a few times before. So that's why you're having a problem. We do crate training, and if uh, for some reason you can't do that or don't want to do that, you at least need to get an exercise pin down there and layer it with puppy pads so he stops getting in the habit of going on the floor. Um, yep, that's cool. about it. That's all I got for you, Sarah. All right. Number seven. seven. Next question is from Nicole. Nicole asks... How do you get a puppy to stop chasing other pets? 
My 10 week old ESS. What is ESS? Springer Spaniel, but what's the E? Keeps pouncing on my cat. English. English Springer Springer Springer. Well, it's a 10, it's a ten week old. It's a 10 week old. It's, a, it's gonna pounce on your cat. It's gonna pounce it's on gonna everything. It's gonna pounce on anything that goes around it. Probably thinks that cat is like the most fun playmate ever. This is awesome. And for some reason runs away, and then it's even more fun. But then it gets up in a cat tree, and he doesn't understand why it doesn't like him more. And come down more. <laughs> it's 10 weeks old. You, you don't stop really a 10 week old. Um, you want to be more preventative. So uh, you want your, the, the, the 10 week old should be highly, highly structured, not a ton of free roaming, things like that. So the cat shouldn't be around, um, especially when you're training the puppy. It's a huge distraction. It's like another playmate. It's like having another puppy around. And your poor um, Springer Spaniel doesn't understand what your cat's problem is. Why doesn't he come down more so I can pounce on him more? Isn't this fun? <laughs> like then, for example, when we're in a conversation with our spouses, you know, we're in deep conversation, we're listening, we're trying to listen, and then we see a fly. Yes. We get distracted. Well, yes. puppies, that's like a million times worse. <laughs> you know? It's like... It doesn't have to be a fly. It's like a flash of light. <laughs> Chris sees a flash of light. He's like, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> or I'm like, is that spider? No, it's not a spider. <laughs> And then my mind just goes off in something else. And I'm like, wow, I really hate spiders. And that's when I got bit. And I'm just completely going as off. I'm, like... As I'm still talking. <laughs> so take that times 100 and that's your puppy. Um, what you can do, though, I mean, what you can do is have your puppy drag when it's when your puppy is out and you're not completely on top of it, but you should still be a little bit, and the cat might be out too, is have the puppy drag around that six-foot leash. Um, puppies should always be dragging around leashes if they're free roaming in the house. Um, that way you don't always go and grab the puppy to get it away from something, and then they're like, oh, this is fine. I'll keep going over here, and mom keeps coming over to me and picking me up. So you want to have a, a leash on her, on him, and um, yeah, doesn't say him or her, and um, actually work on it. So when the cat is out, let the puppy like be like, ooh, the cat, and start to walk towards it, and you go, her name is Happy, so I just use Happy, and you go, Happy, and then you put, and then you lean up, put a piece of food by his face, and then he, when he's like, oh, food. <laughs> she's so confused. She's, know, she's like, she's I'm so right confused. here. Why are you hitting it out there? <laughs> and then you, you move backwards away from the cat and be like, come here. And, and that, so you just create this kind of muscle memory of see the cat, come to mom. See the cat, come to mom. But you have to work on that. You have to practice that, which is why I say 10 weeks old is so young um, that I would just be preventative at that age. Wait till it gets a few more weeks on it, a little bit more training, impulse control training, and then try to do the leash work. That's what I would do um, because it's baby, you know, and six months old, it's going to be a big baby and really, and could possibly hurt your cat. Um, so do you definitely want to work on this? I'm not trying to put you off or anything, but it's 10 weeks old. You should be doing more things to prevent bad habits of bad behavior than having to tackle them. I hope that makes sense at 10 weeks old. So like one of the previous questions had to do with counter surfing and one of them had mentioned a, uh, a 12 week old or a 14 week old puppy getting on the counter to get chips. I know it was an accident, but you just can't make a habit of that because then you create bad habits <laughs> so when it comes to puppy training most of it in 99% of it is about preventing bad habits so you don't have to train them out of those bad habits you can train good behaviors I would say when that puppy hits like 14 weeks old you're walking him more getting more exercise able to do some stay things like that then you can start working on the recalls off of the cat now it's a little I'd say it's a little early all right all right next question is Number eight is from Elaine. Elaine Bennett. Uh, no, it says... I'm just saying, because I'm on a Seinfeld kick right now. Never mind. All right. I have, Elaine writes, I have four kids, age 11 to 16, which means socks are everywhere at my house. My seven-month-old pup has eaten at least two that I'm aware of. <laughs> poop. She got little poop icons here. That's hilarious. Uh, if she has one and sees me, she immediately drops it. Uh, but sometimes she sneaks into the kids' room or bathroom where before we realize it. I have used anything. I haven't used anything but food at this point. She always says she's always on a leash, so I usually give a swift pop for bad behavior. She's a golden noodle. Aha. Okay. 
Um, golden doodle. Good luck with that. Okay, no, I'm just kidding. I have insight. Um, well, you do say you give a, a swift pop for bad behavior, so you are doing corrections. You're not just using food. So, um, seven months old. Um, it sounds like you're doing a four kids. I have one child, and I it's enough. Um, <laughs> um, so, so I can imagine, um, and it sounds like you're already putting in as much structure as you can, uh, quite a bit, you know, as far as the rooms and things like that and the bathrooms. Mm, so socks are tricky. Um, I've had clients have to cut their dogs open because socks have gotten lodged in stomachs and intestines and stuff. So that definitely does worry me. You know, you say you give a swift pop for bad behavior. I would say, um... It needs, she's being a prom. And I would actually actively work with her with socks around. There's that cat again. He's focused on something else. Um, we got cats on our roof, on our pergola. They get up there driving my border collie crazy when he's in the house. Um, they fight up there too. It's crazy. Okay, anyway, so. If you have any suggestions on how to get rid of cats <laughs> on the roof. So this is a little difficult to explain in a, in a video, or I mean in, in like just talking to you in a video rather than showing you, but you need a good strong no. Don't use leave it, don't use anything else, just no. And, and I don't know what your seven month old knows, but I'm gonna hope that he knows place command and he knows stay. And at seven months old, there's no reason he can't stay in place command for like a good hour. We work him up to a few hours at seven months old, but four kids, let's hope you got an hour out of that puppy. So let's say you can do an hour. And then let me go even further and say, hopefully you've trained that puppy to be able to go to his bed and then call him over to you and maybe go to another bed. So you can pattern place. And if you can't pattern place, because um, you only have one bed, you can call him over and tell him to down and stay. And then go back over to place, dog's name come, place. Go back over, across the room, dog's name come, down, stay. And then I would put socks out. And I would have him drag around a leash on a, pr on, well I don't want him dragging a leash on a prong. So if you don't have a long line where he can be on a, on a prong, just have him drag around a leash on a flat collar. and. That's one step, is work with him, socks, being around, toys, multiple things. And call him over to you and make sure he avoids them. And um, I don't think you've done, no, seven months old, you probably haven't done e-call or training or anything. So I'm going to assume it's just leash. Oh, yeah, she said just leash stuff and food. Okay. So there's that aspect of it. And I would do this in different rooms. So if you walk your dog for an hour twice a day, take... 20 minutes out of that and work inside with socks laying around work in the bathroom in a downstay calling her out into the living room and having him lay down in place with socks around and if he picks one up no go over to him he's dragging around a leash on his flat collar or on a martingale pop firm firm as you can manage seven months old he can handle firm corrections firm as you can manage. I mean, I would grab two hands, no, pop, to where he was like, holy crap, and dropped that sock and never wanted to pick one up again. That's why I said prong collar initially. So, there's that. Stop, start taking things away from your kids when they leave socks out. No, come on. <laughs> you clearly don't have children. I, I, I all up, I can I, say is... He's is, the youngest in his family. He knows nothing. All I, have, I can I say is younger she started brothers. taking things away from me. Because I left socks out, that might fix my issue. No, it wouldn't. Yeah, you're right. Did your mother ever get you to pick up your room or any of that? No, she did everything for you. If you, did, if, you did. if you didn't do it, yes, she did. No, she would. My mom would throw my clothes away if I. She would be like, if you don't pick these clothes up, you're gonna have to. I'm gonna throw them away. I'm like, whatever, mom. And then she would throw them away. Parenting advice tips from Chris Davison, who has no children and is the baby in his family. I have imaginary kids, and they All do right. everything I tell them. <laughs> Just stop, <laughs> stop, stop. Anyway, that's one aspect of what I would work on. The other aspect of what I would work on is having, um, and I know she, he probably doesn't do anything with you in front of him, but I would actually have like a sock. And I would be like, I, I would have him on a prong collar in a downstair and place command. And I would look at the sock and I would like toss it on the ground. And if he went for it, I would be like, no, pop. 
and probably after just one good pop on a prong collar. You just scared me by dropping your phone. I didn't drop it on the ground. I don't care. Things are expensive. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I, like, I would oh probably do it again, nope. see that he didn't go for it, and then I would put the sock right next to him where he's laying, and if he so much as went to sniff it, no pop. Really make it off limits. Um, that's not something you can do every day. I get that, but I would do it a few. I would do it two, three times a week for a few weeks. See if it helps, and go from there, and go from there, and keep me updated. But yeah, when it comes to stuff like this, we we deal. Believe it or not, <laughs> retrievers, golden retrievers, especially. Um, that's probably just because we get more goldens than labs. But anyway, we we deal with this a lot, where we how we have to entice them with like a shoe we do this with puppies too as we'll take off a shoe and we'll put the puppy in a down stay and be like "Woo, fun shoe and if they so much as go reach out and break that like personal space of the shoe <laughs> to sniff it no because we want it to be totally off limits socks are dangerous you want to mess around with that do not want to mess around with that question number nine is that right yeah Question number nine is from Michelle. Michelle writes, I adopted a pup about three years ago. She was going to be sent to the kill shelter otherwise. At 14 weeks, she was fearful of anything and anyone knew. After doing a lot of work with her, uh, she improved some. Uh, she, would never take, she would never take treats when outside of our home, which is her comfort zone because she is so fearful. Uh, she's 90 pounds and will bark at anything coming into the house. Although, she has shown no aggression towards humans other than being vocal. I only introduce her on a leash or with a muzzle after the person has been thoroughly trained to not pet her or touch her. She will eventually, after five minutes or so, ignore the person completely uh, and curiously sniff them. But as soon as they stand up or leave the room, we have to start all over again. Uh, I saved up and sent her to a very reputable trainer for a two-week boot camp and very little change except she was better at healing and if you say the word off she winces and stops whatever she's doing for a moment for, uh, from e-collar training. I'm not rich but I'm considering finding a way to find another trainer that can assist. Uh, I've had six dogs <laughs> this one right here. I've had six dogs, three currently, and have successfully overcome aggression issues with food, humans, and other animals, but it, it's evident that I'm not qualified to work with a very fearful dog one so fearful that she is not food or toy driven and the sound of a clicker makes her want to hide i'll never give up on her but i'm close to giving up on the idea of her being a normal dog she's most well behaved at home uh, she's the most well behaved snuggle bug and obedient <laughs> dog uh, when it's just a family at home but no one else gets to see that side of her or, or see the side sorry this was long-winded but i'm getting desperate Okay, what's her? Michelle? Yeah. Um, if you're getting desperate, then you need to uh, do a Skype call with me. Um, if you want to, email me and we'll set it up because I would like to talk to you much more thoroughly about this. I would like to talk to you about the e-collar training she's already had and give, and give you tons of ways to tweak it in a way that's gonna be more beneficial for you. Now maybe the other trainer went over those ways to do that and cause some, even when I, when I work with people, some of the things that I say, especially the more advanced steps, they kind of fall by the wayside and I keep up with them if they want. Sometimes they don't bother cause they're happy enough with whatever you know has happened, but I try to keep up with them to progress. So um, there's just a lot of tweaks that I would like to make to what you're doing what you're doing at home, how you're introducing her to people. I think you're putting too much pressure on her, it sounds like already. Um, if she's never bitten anyone, I don't understand why she's on a muzzle, because she shouldn't be, be putting so much pressure on that you think she would bite if she's never shown any inclination to bite. Um, if she's just barking. You may need some more info. Yeah, I, I, I think so. I think I might need just some more info too. Um, so I don't, I don't wanna dive too deeply into your specific thing, just because this is super serious, it sounds, um, not the like like she's gonna bite people, but I mean the level of fear, and I would like more info, and I would like to really help you set up 
um, some things. I don't hear you talking about food at all. Maybe that's because you didn't bother to put it in. But you should be using food a lot. We just these... finished with a super fearful dog right yeah. like a couple weeks ago. Yeah. He didn't eat for a week. We had yeah, him for three crazy. weeks. And the whole thing was if he didn't eat from our hand, he didn't eat at all. It's not like we didn't feed him. <laughs> we offered it to him every day, many times a day. If he didn't eat from our hand, he didn't eat at all. So then he got hungry enough. It was the longest we ever had a dog go. Um, it was like five, six days, and he took a little bit. And then all of a sudden his drive kicked in, and we were able to overcome so many obstacles. Food is incredibly powerful, um, but you, there's ways to use it correctly. So. Sorry, I'm not going to drone on and on. I really would like to do a Skype with you. It does cost some money, but I'm not ridiculously expensive, I swear. Um, so email me if you want to do that. In the meantime, let me just give you an example of another dog that we worked with. Some of the steps that we went through. It was uh, e-collar trained. It was a very young dog. Russo is who I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Russo was fear aggressive, so he had also never bitten anyone, but he sure looked like he was gonna. And if he had been pushed into a corner, he would. He definitely would. But he hadn't yet. It was all barking and nervousness and like, I'm gonna get you, but he didn't really want to. And so what we did was after the training, and, and we did, what? Sorry. Are you making fun of me? Yeah, you're like, this is very serious stuff. Bob and weave. Bob and weave. Sorry. Are you done? I'm not really, but go ahead. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, when he went back home, he was on a very strict schedule uh, for, uh, luckily his parents were very social people. They were, they were older and they um, didn't have kids and they, they, uh, they entertained a lot. So it was a good, good match as far as bad behavior goes because they were able to work with him a lot. I mean, he had to see like 25 people with no growling, no barking, and he was corrected firmly if he did. Um, with a no, not an off, but a verbal no. And um, and he had to stay in place command. So he, he had like a safe zone where no one would enter into his safe zone, at least not in the beginning. He had to, We had to build trust first. This is this fearful dog, a, a fearful dog that thinks that everyone might touch him. So he has to behave a certain way to prevent that from happening because he was scared. So we would never break that plane. So we just expected him to behave. You stay there, you behave. And then, and then when he behaved, in a very specific way, we started introducing food like crazy. Um, a few months goes by, he does really well except with one person. Um, they are very good at following the rules with the, the dog doesn't exist, stays in the corner on place command, just watches people and learns to trust. <laughs> Then we started slowly um, incorporating, if he was comfortable, if he wasn't, as long as he wasn't corrected, as long as there's no growling, no barking during the knocking process and people coming in and he seemed relaxed, the owners would go over to him, tell him break and walk him around the room. So not even make a beeline right to the people that were there, but just walk him around the room. If he reached out and sniffed, just, just for this, good food. And, and then again, no petting. How do I smell? You, you never smell bad, but you don't smell great. I hate blue one. Anyway, <laughs> um, with this particular dog, he would warm up to people. So you could tell very... Um, okay, sorry about that. But with this particular dog, um, you could tell like when he would warm up. And, and then we would instruct how to go about engaging with the dog. And it wouldn't be through touch. I would never have someone touch a dog, physically touch a dog, that... Um, might have a bad reaction to it. And by bad reaction, I mean just, whoa, what are you doing? You've lost all the trust. You've worked so hard to gain. So we use food instead. Um, we use, we don't face dogs. We go at them from the side and give food this way. And there's just so many little things. Um, hopefully that gives you some ideas, but it sounds like this dog probably has too much freedom, is making too many decisions, has too much to think about and the more decisions you take away from this dog not just healing and how to greet people but in so many other areas too without being crazy hyper structured there's a lot of other little things that we could probably do to just take some of the decision making and some of the stress load off of this dog's mind um, but yeah, but I would just, I would, I would love to talk to you more about this because there's a lot of nuances. There's a lot of little things when it comes to fear stuff that is so very specific to the dog. Um, no. 
Uh, I'm really sorry that you didn't get more out of your board and train. I would be really interested to know who that was too um, and, and where you live because uh, I might know someone in your area too that could that could help. Um, but yeah, I mean two weeks, we, we probably wouldn't even take in a dog like that for two weeks because in two weeks all we'd be able to do is, is, is teach the basics. Yeah, yeah, is just get to know him, teach all the basics and teach the e-collar, but not actually be able to target the issues at hand. Be at least a three or four weeker. It would be a three to four weeker for sure. Um, so anyway, you know, and not, not that like our way is any better than anybody else's way, but... Uh, <laughs> but it is. But it is. No, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, there's there's lots of really great e-collar yeah. training people out there and and, and I don't want to pretend to understand what they think they did that was good and, and bad and what you think you that they did that was good and bad. And there's times that we've taken in dogs for two weeks, but then, you know... We've asked for more time. We've asked for more time because it's just like every dog is different. So yeah. you don't... you It may take longer, longer to break through yeah. uh, whatever the issue is. Yeah, so. that's very true. And, and we try to be really honest with people. Like I just said, like if it had been two weeks with a fearful dog, I might have been like, look, if this is all you can afford and I can't give you a better deal than this, this is probably as far as we're going to get, but I'll give you the tools to continue the rehabilitation process. So maybe that's what you're missing. Or maybe, Michelle, sometimes I have clients that I find out that they're having problems and they never told me. They were like, eh, I guess it's good enough for now and we're trying to just figure things out. I'm like, why didn't you email me and tell me or call me? Because I'll sit there, you paid me for X amount. I'll sit there and talk to you for an hour on the phone to work out some stuff. Um, I have people I've done Skype calls with before because they live a little too far out because I'm in LA and traffic's awful. So I'll hop on a Skype call with them, see what they're doing so I can pinpoint what they're doing wrong. It's what they paid me for. So maybe, Michelle, maybe your trainer would love to help you out further and follow up with you, but maybe you just don't really want to reach out and, and deal with it for whatever reason, because I get clients that, that sometimes are hesitant about that. And I'm like, why didn't you tell me? And it's frustrating for me as a trainer sometimes. So that's kind of just something too that's probably, that's probably good, just to put a little bit of accountability on you too, since I, I don't know who you used or, or what the style was, but but definitely don't, you know, just let it go because you don't want to bother him or maybe you didn't even care for the techniques, so you just don't want to deal with it anymore. No. If if you have if you um if he's supposed to continue to help, <laughs> you need to contact him. But in the meantime, I'd love to do a Skype. All right, question number ten is from Gina. Gina, Gina writes, I have a five year old mixed breed with a possible with possible wolf. Uh, he has always had issues with other dogs, but not as bad as as now. I can barely control him when we see another dog while while walking, and that is with a pinch collar. That's a prong collar. Okay. Uh, no. One time he pulled and twisted while we were walking, and he got off the pinch collar and attacked the puppy and injured him. We will put his he will put his teeth on me and try to get away from me if we see another dog while we are walking. In attempts to get away from me so he can get to the other dog. He has not broken the skin. Uh, I now will only take him out uh, with a harness, pinch, pinch collar, collar, and a muzzle. muzzle. Um, he appears to be scared as he will shake when he when we go to the vet and he is not able to get to, get to the other dogs in the waiting area. Uh, so he feels highly threatened. Yeah. I've attempted to take him uh, to training, but have been refused because of his aggressiveness. Uh, I've checked into private trainers, but I can't. Okay. I've checked into private trainers, but I can't afford the hundred dollars a visit. Uh, I feel this. I feel this behavior has worsened since my grown children moved out. He's the sweetest dog and loves people. I'm willing to do anything to help him. All right, scroll back up. I can't see. Okay, Gina, Gina five-year-old mixed breed, possible wolf. Okay. So, I'm trying to see the picture of a dog. <laughs> Making a mess. Okay. Um, all right, Gina. So here's the thing. Um, I can barely control him. Okay. There's a lot going on here. Um, first of all, with a dog like this, we would never do prong collar training. We would do prong collar to teach some basics, basic leash behavior, because it's great for guidance, and so the dog can't completely pull us down. But a lot, and, and is, so as good as a, a prong collar is, it's very limited. 
um, it tends to a dog that is truly, truly like arousal focused, unless maybe you're the size of Chris and even then like with the good, well-timed, perfect pop corrections that really knock some sense into the dog. But even then it can actually cause more arousal, which might be what you're experiencing. We do e-collar training. And I know you said you can't afford $100 a visit to go see trainers. I get that. But, um, I mean, you should see how much we charge, you know, for aggressive issues. It's a specialty. It's important um, to know, to, to have the experience and to know the ins and outs. We do sessions. We only do board trains. We only, that yeah. Kind of stuff. It's, it's, yeah. It's, it's not safe. Yeah, we do board and trains to really get inside the head of the dog and tackle it. From a different issue you say great at home great with people but I'm sure there are many many things at home you can be doing to greatly help you on the walks so I hope it doesn't feel like I'm pushing you off like not giving you help but I just feel like this is pretty serious and I don't and especially with like the biting back at you trying to get off leash to get like that type of angst you gotta get professional help no, 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 hang on. You need to purchase an e-collar and you need to purchase the right e-collar. So it needs to be, in my opinion, um, e-collar technologies. You could start with a mini educator. Um, you can get them on Amazon for $180. If you contact me directly, I could get it to you a little cheaper, not much, but a little, because I'd have to ship it. Um, I don't normally do that, but I could do that. And then uh, I would say you would need at least one Skype call with me or with another trainer that does e collar training, because that would be less expensive than going and seeing one. Um, and then uh, there are tons of free videos on how to teach low level e collar training as a positive, as just a cue, as, hey, come here, hey, sit down, and then something a little bit firm, like, no, I said stay, sorry, um, and then, so you can whisper with it, but you can shout, and so there's a lot of online videos that are free, where I could really help you get a handle on this, but yeah, you'd have to save up some pennies first to be able to do a phone call or a Skype call and purchase the e-collar. And I can give you, and, and then if you tell me, if you want to send me an email, tell me where you live. I'll uh, see if I know anyone in your area. You could Skype them instead. I mean, I don't care. I'm just telling you, uh, telling you what I would do. I would do e-collar training. I would not do prong anymore. Um, in the meantime, you see a dog, you turn around, you avoid. So you try to react before he reacts. So I'm walking him this guy over here and this is how we started doing squirrel issues is I'm walking him down the street and as soon as I see him ears like you you may not get that I hope you do so let's assume that you get something there's a dog before the explosion whenever I see any alertness stiffness ears crinkly forehead anything that's when I go let's go pop turn around other direction and take control of the situation um, so I would give a firm I would give a correction as hard as I could if I had a dog like yours as hard as I could for looking because by the time they've exploded your moments gone so it's for looking that way I nip that in the bud and 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 it's follow me you do not look at another dog like that you come with me um, that would be the best advice I can give you for now until you do try something else, try another tool. All right? All right. I hope that helps. Good luck. Moving on, question number 11 is from Enza. Enza writes, uh, she has a 16-week-old Maltese Shih Tzu cross puppy, very mouthy, uh, broken skin on my hands more than uh -huh. once, especially when she is overexcited or during grooming. Uh, we are a crate trainer, trying to incorporate daily walks and structure as well as training with her kibble. Place come. Uh, sit, place, come, dance, etc. <laughs> dance. <laughs> um, which she is eager to do, but how do I help her stop the extreme biting? 16 week old, you can correct that puppy. So you got a leash on her, you pop her. 
firm no. I mean firm. And by pop, I mean um, it's like a jab. So you don't like pop and keep it tight. It's like a pop and you give back in uh, slack again. So, you know, if, if I'm working with her or if I'm brushing her, I'll keep a leash on her. I brush and I also have food on me. You should be using food too, lots of food with a 16 week old. And she goes to bite me, no grab, leash, pop. And and what I mean by jab is just that like you don't pop and like keep it tight and you pull. Treat. Yeah, it's like it's like uh this, you know? Um <laughs> I'm using you a lot tonight. Um or get a pet corrector. Squirt of air. You can get them on Amazon, you can get them at Petco, Pet Smart, and no ch and it startles them and it creates a bit of an inhibition. But with a really driven puppy, sometimes that's not enough. So that's that's where I would start. And then let me know how that goes and we can go from there. Cool. Question number 12 is from Joan. Joan, Joan writes, we have a 19 week old mini Aussie who is our little snuggle bug and we love him to bits, except for these issues. <laughs> uh, we've been trying to do the right thing so he would develop the right behaviors as he grows up, uh, but there are but these are causing us some frustration. Number one, bark frantically if my husband or I leave the room for 30 seconds. And this can go on for quite some time if we don't qu return quickly. Okay, let's just do this one at a time. All right, so well, how is he barking frantically? Because I would just crate train him. And, and so that's not, that's not an issue anymore. Like you crate train him if he barks in the crate and just say no tap the crate and that's usually enough to get him to shut up most of the time Ooh, 19 weeks old so he's a little on the older side too yeah so and he's already spoiled he's already because <laughs> of that oh the, snuggle bug he's love a snuggle him to bug bit. so that's Ooh. why he's barking like crazy you red gotta flag. give him things more structure red flag red flag way way more structure yeah you need to lighten up on the snuggle bug stuff yeah that's why he's hyper attached to you guys so yeah you've got to really really cut that out um Go to number two. Uh, number two, tends to be mouthy or nippy if he gets corrected, such as pulling him off something in the yard that he shouldn't get into. If, if we prevent him from doing something he wants, then he turns his head around and nips. No respect. Well, guess what? You, no you respect. guys are all just, you know, fun and games. He doesn't respect you or think you are, have any authority over him whatsoever. You're a playmate. So he's challenging you because he views you just as another littermate, as a playmate. Go to three. We can be playing nice and cuddling, and he will get sometimes, and he will sometimes get into a behavior where he is all over Keep us, going. nipping and biting. Uh, though the force of these bites have decreased over the weeks, as we've tried to help keep diverting him to appropriate chew toys and keep repeating no bite. Sorry, <laughs> we realized that it was too dark, and we had to move inside. Okay. So anyway, um, yeah, you have you have no everything is the same. You have just zero zero respect from your puppy. It sounds like he's getting way too much freedom. Um, hopefully, you're crate training him. He has alone time every day. Um, I would stop petting him completely for two weeks, and I would do only food rewards. Try to change the mindset of this puppy a little bit, and kind of get into this mode where everything is just clean, good treat, you know, come sit down, treat, and just um, those are your positive interactions with him. And otherwise any barking is corrected with a leash pop or you could do a pet corrector. A uh, pet corrector is a squirt of air, it comes in a red can. You can get it at, uh, hey buddy, you can get it at Petco or PetSmart or on Amazon.com. And that's what I would start with, bad behavior, short squirt. You do short little squirts. Um, and I would just really work on his basic obedience and on walks and and just keep things Keep an emotional like barrier there because because you You can't undo The relationship start but you need to start working on a new way of him looking at you because you think things are bad now I mean, he's just now getting into adolescence things could get a lot worse really fast in the next few months so you've got to get some control over him and by doing that you need to get him on a schedule so for instance you know when we get puppies in here or if i work with people and their puppies they get a schedule uh crate at night out for you know one well, he's not going to stay there it's not comfortable come here bud why don't you go to place there you go down and uh and they get up in the morning out to potty you know 
15 minute walk, work on place and down and come for 10 minutes, uh, out to potty one more time, back and crate for an hour, uh, comes back out, 30 minutes of playtime, uh, another 10 minutes of working with the dog on like with food on basics, three hours in crate, out again, out for a walk. So everything is highly structured. So there's not just this free for all um, in the house. And then, uh, and then if they have any issues with the biting or things like that, they correct for the biting, of course. And then like with the pet corrector or the leash, but if you haven't, if there's not um, leash training there, then you don't necessarily want to use leash. I don't know how much training you guys have done with them, uh, but I do know that these pups are super smart, super keen. Um, they're going to want to do a lot. They're going to want to explore a lot, learn a lot of new things. Um, and the impulse control is going to be one of the biggest things with that breed <laughs> for sure. Well, with any breed, but definitely with, with these, these mini Aussies, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Especially with these mini Aussies, they tend to be a full grown Aussie in a tiny wound up small dog package. So, uh, so yeah, you're going to want to keep that in mind for sure. All right. Question number 13 is from Bridget. Bridget writes, okay. This is embarrassing, but our Winston is a butt sniffer. <laughs> uh, anyone who comes into the house has been checked out by him, and that means his snoot to their rear. Uh, any suggestions on how to stop that? Is it instinctual? No. Damn. Yep. <laughs> it's instinctual, but they shouldn't be allowed to do it to humans. We just had a dog in here, Walter, who would do that. He's a huge crotch sniffer, and then he would also goose you and other people all the time. Um, you just, you correct for it. How old? It doesn't say. It doesn't say. Um, so I don't know what type of training you've done with them, but like leash training or like prong collar, harness, things like that. But yeah, you want to correct for that. Now, you don't, like let's say you've done prong collar training, which is a training tool that you can really correct with. You don't want to like set him up and then he goes to sniff someone's butt and then you nail him with a pop correction right out of the gate. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> but what I would do is um, I would just set him up to do a little better. So when he does greet people, he's on a leash um, inside and out when new people come in, um, things like that. So, so I, would, I would tell him place break, let him greet. And then if he even thought about trying it, I would do a more low key no like for a few times, um, just to kind of, so he's not shocked when you do correct him. So it's kind of like, um, you know, if a dog, if a dog gets up and rushes the door and barks and then is just nailed, just corrected outright. I don't really think that's fair. I like to teach place command first, teach them how to stay in place, then have someone come in the door and correct them for breaking place command. So my point is, is I don't just want to set him up to fail and nail him or anything. So I would try to guide him, um, do little pop cues away from the crotch sniffing or the butt sniffing. Um, and then after you've done that a few times and he's just a little bit calmer in general, he's just a little bit better about greeting then you can really correct him. Like, does he have, you know, my question would be, does he have a really good concept of no at that point, a good understanding of no, like really understands that no means don't do that. So then you can start to pair the butt sniffing and the leash pops, and make them a little bit more intense with a verbal no after you've done it a few times, more low key and steered him more in the right direction, uh, helped him be a little bit calmer. Now, if he did that to me, if I was like walking by him and he did that to me, I, I, um, the big thing would be is you want to claim space and that can be hard to do when a dog goes behind you, but what you just same if a dog jumped on my back, instead of moving away and then going towards the dog, I would actually try to turn around, but actually step back into the dog, turn around and then continue to step forward towards the dog to claim my space and say no, very, very firmly. So really step with purpose, not just step up. And, and I think the big mistake people make is just like when a dog jumps on you, you know, in the front, they might put a knee up or move forward into the dog, but they don't commit that other foot and claim that space that the dog was just in. So if I had a dog sniff me uh, from behind, um, I, would, I would absolutely lean backwards into it quickly turn, move in towards the dog, even bump the dog with my leg, tell him to get out of my space. Cause that's my space, not his space. So off leash as the owner, just walking around the house. If that were to happen, that's how I would, that's how I would handle that. So cool.
Question number 14 is from Ashley. Ashley writes, I will be getting a seven-week-old puppy this weekend. I know the age isn't ideal, but he is getting his eviction notice as his family is moving soon. Uh, we are the potty training guy. We are the potty training guidelines. Oh, I meant what are, sorry. What are? <laughs> what are the potty training guidelines for someone like me who lives in an apartment but can't teach him to go potty outside until he's fully vaccinated? Uh, I plan on using potty pads until he can go outside, but do you have any tips for transitioning him off the pads? and learn to go outside when it's time. Thanks so much, love your videos and all that you guys do. He doesn't need to be fully vaccinated. He would be like 16 weeks old. I think it's like three weeks apart. Mm -hmm. So it'd be eight weeks plus three weeks plus three weeks. Vets are always. Yeah, vets are hyper diligent because they, they don't want the dog running around a park, picking up feces from other animals. They can get parvo, things like that. But he doesn't have to be fully vaccinated. When you, you should be taking him to the vet right away, get his first round of boosters. I think they take a few days to kick in. And what you do is you, you I wouldn't let him like walk down the stairs or out of your apartment building because he could pick stuff up off the floor and you just don't want to bother with that. I would carry him out in the, the first few weeks. Um, and then just put him on one patch of grass that doesn't have other crap on it and things like that and tell him to potty. And then yeah, you use potty pads in the meantime, we crate train, and then when the dogs come out of their crate, um, yes, they're in an area that's fully covered with puppy pads, and then um, we do that for a week or two. Then we take one puppy pad away, make sure they don't go in that one space without the pad for another week or two. Then we take another puppy pad away, as long as they still go on the pads and not on the floor. Then we take another puppy pad away, and that's how we do that through, the, through puppyhood, but you still take you can still take them outside, and and you definitely want to do that as soon as possible. If you wait, the harder it's going to be, and you're going to be really frustrated, and that's yeah. going to frustrate the puppy and make things even worse as well. And it has nothing to do with transitioning him off the pads. I mean, a lot of dogs just do that naturally, to be honest, because it's much more instinctive for them to go on the grass. I'm talking about behavior stuff. You don't. It would be awful to not expose a dog to outside noises and things like that until they're you know, 16 weeks old or whatever the case is, you'll be, you'll have a whole new mess of trouble on your hands if he's never seen a vehicle go by <laughs> or if he's never seen another human go by and things like that until he's fully vaccinated with his three boosters. So there's other reasons why, you know, that I want you to, to take him out occasionally so he can smell those smells and, and just sounds and things like that and get used to that every day but you just can't walk him you can't let him pick up things off the ground and you can't let him mill about and then after they get two rounds of boosters um then you can walk them like there's no reason just you just have to make sure you keep them away from any feces that um comes from another animal that you don't know so you you can't go to a park but you can walk them down the sidewalk um there's no reason you can't so hopefully that helps and then as you really get into this you got some more specific questions, definitely let me know. But we crate train the puppies to teach them to hold their pee. Um, we'll let them out every couple of hours. Uh, sometimes less than that um, when they're puppies. Usually through the night though, they can probably make it uh, maybe three to four hours for two weeks. And then you could probably go six hours, maybe. We'll see how you're doing. And I don't know what breed you're getting. That makes a difference too. Larger breed dogs can hold their pee for longer at a very young age usually. Um, so that'll make a difference too. But yeah, just let me know how it's going and, uh, and we can go from there. So cool. I hope that helps. You know what time it is? Tool time. No, I, I don't know. Quote of the day. Quote of the day. So I don't have a new one. It's one I've used before, but I don't think I have, I haven't used it since like the, one of the first episodes of this, but I'm going to go back to it cause I have something that I actually look at on a daily basis and I have for the last two to three years. And my, the quote is, if you're tired of starting over, stop giving up. If you're tired of starting over, stop giving up. So that can go with anything with, your, with the training of the dogs. You can make so much progress and then you stop, guess what? Once you stop, it's, it, training is a continuous thing and you have to continuously, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Keep like just consistency. It's gotta be consistency. It you gotta be consistent about it. Yeah. Um, Dusty, our our border collie, highly trained dog. But guess what? We give him structure on a daily basis, so his training is continuing on a daily basis. Yeah. Like remind at least reminders to like, to stay fresh. Exactly. Uh, other things. Uh, fitness. Oh gosh, fitness. If you're tired of starting over, guess what? Stop, Stop giving yeah. up. 
Um, I hear, that's something I hear on a daily basis from, well, when I used to do a lot of personal training. I don't really do it so much anymore because I'm busy, but the, um, I have friends that constantly are complaining. And I've actually told them, stop, stop complaining to me. I don't want to hear it anymore. Because <laughs> it's still, I'm, I'm, like, I'm not 19 anymore. Stop. As I've gotten older, I've become, more, I've become more straightforward, more blunt. Stop. If you're tired of starting over, stop giving up. Because all that does is it pushes you back. Yeah, it kills it, motivation. It, it kills motivation. Yeah. When you can momentum. be so, momentum, oh, it, it just kills it. You can be so much further, but now you're, you're stuck. It's, like, it's almost like a time travel. <laughs> back to the future, you know. You're basically traveling back into the past, back when, you you know, more oppression, when you could have, like, further in the future, less oppression. <laughs> um, but uh, stop giving up. And that goes to the same thing. If you have, like, a goal in life, if you give up and you stop working towards that, guess what? You have to start all over again. So stop giving up. If something is worth it and it's hard, most things in life that are that are worth it are hard. Yeah. You have to work towards it. Um, if it's not hard, then it's probably not worth your time and effort. If that makes any sense. Yeah. So um, yeah, that's my uh, quote of the day. Is if you're tired <laughs> of starting over, stop, stop giving, giving up. Yeah, it's a good one. It's a really good reminder. <laughs> and that's actually something I have on my fridge. So every morning I actually see it every afternoon. Well, I'm not usually here in the afternoon, but at night I see it. So it's something that I constantly nail over and over and over and over. And I see it constantly in my head because I really have one it drilled in my head so I don't forget that. Yeah, it's a good one, baby. Yep. It's a good one. All right, guys. See you next time.